Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly fix of all things history. Coming up on this week's show... We get exclusive access to actual artefacts from the Nuremberg Trials. And I begin my epic hike through history along Pilgrim's Way. First up, the news. Archaeologists in Cambridge have found 25 skeletons on the site of a medieval friary in the centre of the city. The remains could be up to 450 years old. And in Chichester, Roman houses have been discovered. Archaeologists say they're stunned by the degree of preservation. And a skeleton discovered at a Roman-era burial site in Northamptonshire has evidence of unique mutilation. The man had been buried face down with his tongue removed and a stone wedged into his mouth. Now, last week you memorably found out what kind of clothing a pilgrim would have worn in medieval times. And this week you've gone a lot further. Yes, it's been on my to-do list for many years now and I've finally taken the opportunity to walk the famous and ancient trail between London and Canterbury. We present Pilgrim's Way. Like so many medieval journeys, ours begins in the city of London. The original stone London Bridge was built as a shrine by Henry II to his murdered friend Thomas Becket. And from this point, countless thousands would journey on pilgrimage to the murder scene at Canterbury Cathedral. Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, had feuded with his former friend, King Henry II, over the power of the church. And on the 29th of December, 1170, Becket was brutally murdered by four knights inside Canterbury Cathedral. They believed their king, Henry II, had wanted the turbulent Thomas dead. The pilgrimage route heads south through Southwark to a site famous in historical fact and fiction. The original Tabard Inn was destroyed in the 17th century and pilgrims would have left this site on horseback, travelling not at a trot or a gallop but at a canter, derived, it's said, as the most comfortable speed for pilgrims to travel distance to Canterbury was at a canter. I'll have no such luxury, I'll be covering the 70 odd miles on foot. Before I leave the city, I take a detour to the Museum of London and get special access to artefacts associated with the cult of Becket. The first badge that we're looking at here is um, the bust of Thomas Becket and uh, this relates back to one of the really important shrines at Canterbury that uh, pilgrims would have visited it. It uh, was a, uh, a shrine in the shape of, of the bust and it contained the crown of the skull which had been struck off by one of his assassins, by one of the knights that had murdered him in 1170. Um, so it was seen as being a really, really important part of the pilgrimage to visit this shrine. Uh, the shrine, the reliquary itself, was um, heavily encrusted in gold, in precious jewels, and it would have been quite a magnificent thing for ordinary um, people coming to, to visit. They would have been, it would have imbued in them a sense of awe and wonder at, at this um, incredibly holy and special place that they were coming to. Uh, very typically, a pilgrim would have worn a wide-brimmed uh, cap or hat uh, and these uh, sorts of badges would have been attached to that. Um, it was a way that a pilgrim was recognisable when they were making their way um, uh, from the pilgrim site or going to another pilgrim site. Um, if we think today about um, hill walkers having uh, a lot of badges perhaps on their uh, walking sticks or cloth textile ones on their rucksacks, which again show all the places they've been to, it shows what they've achieved. And again, this was part of pilgrimage, it was showing what, uh, where you had been, um, what uh, shrines you had visited. And that shrine was actually destroyed during the Reformation, so this is the only rendering 
of that shrine that survived. These are the only depictions really that we have still today and that give us a good understanding of, of what the, the shrine actually looked like. We have descriptions, um, documentary references to what they would look like and we know that um, people like the King of France had sent a ruby that was supposed to be the size of an egg. Um, you know, it was a decorated, these shrines were decorated with magnificent jewels, um, with gold. Um, so we have a kind of verbal description of what they were like um, but these little badges um, in these base metal um, very kind of quite cheaply made things but ironically they're the things that show us how magnificent and, and how special these places were. And these objects are imbued with that power of belief. Pilgrims who went to the pilgrim sites uh, very strongly believed in the power of these objects. These objects were bought at the pilgrim site because they would have either held the holy water, such as the ampulla would have done, or with the badges they might have been held up in front of or in sight of the reliquary. If you were lucky enough, you may have been able to touch the reliquary um, with the relic with your, um, with your badge. So when you came away from the place of uh, pilgrimage, from the shrine, the um, badge itself would have been felt to have been imbued with these um, very special, miraculous powers. I head east out of Southwark to another historical marker. So this is the site of St Thomas a watering and tradition records that this was the place where Thomas of Canterbury would water his horses as he rode between London and Canterbury. It was here too that Chaucer's pilgrims stopped to hear the first of the Canterbury tales and in Tudor times this was the execution site for the county of Surrey. I cut through Greenwich and Bexley Heath towards my first stop along the way. So, end of day one and I've made it to Dartford. And what better place to stay in than an 18th century coaching inn. 18th century coaching inn, eh? Yes, the Royal Victoria and Bull Hotel built in 1703. Speaking of dates, here's Marguerite. <laughs> Second of February. In order to demonstrate that Lambert Simner was an imposter, Henry VII paraded the real Earl of Warwick for the streets of London today in 1487. Now up next on Viral History, our roving reporter Gemma Chandler gets hands-on with artefacts from one of the most famous trials of the 20th century in this week's Material Evidence. Hi, I'm Gemma Chandler and today we're here at the Galleries of Justice Museum in Nottingham to look at some pretty interesting artefacts. So I've got Bev, who's the senior curator here at the museum, and you're going to talk to me a little bit about this briefcase. So this is actually a briefcase that belonged to Sir Norman Burkitt, who was a well-known and quite highly renowned advocate uh, during the 1930s and was involved in a number of high-profile trials. So he actually tried a local, local woman called Nurse Waddingham, who in 1935 was accused of murdering two of her elderly patients who were in her care for financial gain. So she was arrested and she was tried in our criminal courtroom here at the Shire Hall at the museum and was obviously subsequently found guilty and she was sentenced to execution. Now, Norman Burkett was the prosecutor at the time and this happened to be the last case where a female prisoner was actually found guilty and sentenced to execution here in Nottingham. She wasn't executed in the city, she was actually executed at Winston Green Prison in Birmingham, as it was the most local prison to the city at the time that still executed. Um, so it has a local story attached to it, but also Norman Burkitt became a judge in the 1940s and was involved in the Nuremberg war criminal trials as well. So he actually sat on that council and prosecuted numerous um, Nazi war criminals. So this is quite a significant object for the museum. So what makes this artefact so significant? It's so significant because of its local connection to this particular site itself, its association with a number of notable national trials and obviously its association with 
Nuremberg its role within the Nuremberg war trials as well. So you've got the local, national and international perspectives of this one gentleman's role. So how did it end up here in the galleries? Well, like a lot of the objects that are actually in our collections, it actually was donated to the museum um, from actually members of his family. So it actually sits in our, our collection at the moment and will actually be going on display in February when the museum relaunches itself after it's been through a major redevelopment project. Well, thanks, Bev, for chatting me through that. And join us again next week for some more amazing artefacts. We're reaching our cut-off point this week. We are indeed. But unlike the French royal family, we'll be back. Ooh, harsh. But true. Don't forget to follow Viral History on Facebook and Twitter, like this video, and subscribe to our channel. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you next week.